Uh, sorry about last week. Uh, I just wasn't feeling well that morning, and I know it was really last minute, but uh, I didn't want to stand up here and just be miserable. So um, <clears throat> I just posted last night. Uh, I had been a little bit behind on both grading and posting, so uh, I did post last night um, the video from Tuesday. I expect I'll post Wednesdays and probably today's um, this evening, if not Friday. And so those will be up. Uh, your test will be graded. I'm gonna try to get started on those tomorrow. Uh, I have some time tomorrow to get started on those. And then I've also got uh, a new TA uh, who's gonna be helping me out. And so uh, she'll also be able to help me get some of this, uh, some of this grading done. Um, any questions for me before we get started on this stuff? So what we've been talking about uh, these past couple days has been the brain. Have you guys been in class since we've talked about brain stuff? I don't think so. I think it would have been last uh, Thursday. So basically what we've been doing is talking about those three sections of the brain that I laid out at the beginning of the semester. So the hind brain, uh, which is right here, including uh, the thalamus, and when we give some discussion about whether or not this is in the hindbrain, this is this piece right here, whether or not this is in the hindbrain or midbrain. Let me talk about the midbrain, uh, which is, of course, where most of our emotional reactions come from. We talk about fight or flight, we talk about um, how the pituitary is also involved in controlling your emotions. Your pituitary gland uh, is related to <clears throat> your endocrine system, it's kind of in charge of your endocrine system. So not only do you have these neural emotional responses, that is to say, your feelings in your head, so to speak, but you also have the feelings that your hormones can produce, which is gonna be things like being tired, being hungry, um, being sexually aroused, right? These types of things that hormones uh, are contributing to, in addition to feeling sad, feeling angry, the type of things uh, that you're more likely to feel in your head, so to speak. <clears throat> so we talk about, again, this limbic system is what it's actually known as, and by the way, uh, this uh, hindbrain, um, this is what we would call your autonomic uh, part, of your, part of your brain, the autonomic part of your brain. That is to say, that's where all the automatic stuff is happening, heartbeat, um, reflexes, blood flow, these types of things in addition to some pieces about movement and balance. And then up here is where we are today. And we started talking about that a little bit on Tuesday and then a bit more yesterday. But today I'd like to probably try to finish up this discussion, certainly get into a lot more detail. So a couple of things that we've been over so far, that's highlighted, are that there is some difference between the left and the right brain. One of those differences, or really the main difference, and you've probably heard speech about this before, but one of those differences is that the left brain is better at something that we call serial processing, and the right brain better at something that we call parallel processing. I don't want to go too deep into it, I say that, because uh, it is covered in the previous two lectures, but basically it's the difference between, if I asked you, is it like logical versus creative? No, that is sort of the, the popular pop psychology sense of this difference. I think you'll be able to gather why that comes from that here in a second, but it's the difference between me asking you how many dots do you see there and what you have to do to figure that out and me asking you how many dots you see here and what you have to do to figure that out. What's the difference? The difference between how you figure that out. How 
How many dots are right here? You can see this three times. How many dots are right there? Oh, um, ten. How did you? Know? Wait, what? There's eleven. Are you sure? Ten or eleven? What? How do you know? Because I counted them. Counted. These dots are here. Yeah. How do you know? I counted them. You counted them? I well, I just knew because it was just four. Well, you didn't count them. No, because I can see four dots. Okay. There's more dots over there, so you can count how many there are. But there's just four, and there's the dots. And so you were able to just just see. Just I see. Very good. No, oh, that's right. I'm messing with you. We call this uh, subatype. I think that's an I. Check my spell. Google it. I think it's an A. I don't know. We call it uh, subatyping. Uh, this is our ability, right, to just take in information all at once. So for these four dots, you can just see it. You don't usually need to count that. Your brain can just see four and know four. You can probably get up to five. Maybe six, if I give you an organization you recognize. But when I get to seven, you probably still have to count those although, is that still six? See? Although you might be able to subitize four and three, right? And you get to seven. So you can put these things together but there are these different ways in which we can know these things. Yes, sir? For the, for the one where you put four, like I know for me, the way I thought it was one, two, one, and then I ended up with four. One, two, one. What do you mean? Well, I went down linearly. So there was one dot, then two, then one, and I added that up to four. So I still counted it in my one head. One dot, then two dot, then? One dot. That's how I thought it was. There's one dot at the top, then two below that, and then one below oh, that, and so then you I went, it. you did a kind of a combination. You counted one. Yeah, because like I pretty much did the same. So the dice two, and then one. Yeah, because the, the left one, the first one I did was one. I went four, four, three, four plus four plus three. That's eight plus three. It's eleven. And after that one, I did one plus two plus one, and that's four. Right, and so you can mix these things, right? I try to give something that's a little bit. You can do it here. Uh, when you see me do it in the first two days, I make it messier so that it's harder to organize these in your brain. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's basically what you're able to do, right? You could have went four four, three, you could have went three, four, four, whatever, right? You could have got those numbers by grouping them and just knowing what those numbers were. You still didn't have to go four, one, two, three, four, four, right? You could just kind of group and know. Again, we call this subitizing. This is a parallel process. This is our brain's ability to see something and just know, know what it is. And so here is the real difference between the left brain and the right brain is that the left brain is just better at this. It can do parallel processing, but it's better at serial processing. And the right brain, the opposite, right? It's better at parallel processing. processing. And so uh, it can also do the serial, but it's not as good at it. And so this is kind of why you get that distinction of thinking about people who are, quote, right brain as maybe having this more artistic, this more creative aspect to them. This is really just because of the way in which and the type of things we tend to use one type of processing for over the other. How do we read? What process do we use to read? You open a book and you need to get that information out. How does that occur? You subitize it. What would that look like? Look at the individual words. Well, no, wouldn't it be a combination of both? Because you can see the individual words now, but then you have to put them together in your head to understand what they're saying. Very good, right? Mostly, so he said you can see the individual words and you can know them, but you still have to put the whole thing together into some sentence. I would still consider reading to be much more of a, a serial process, right? And so there are certain words, right, that you just have to be able to see to know what they mean, or how to say them even. And so here's a thing you're going to serial process, but 
the you know can't you ever seen that word right you probably have to serial process how to say it and then maybe think about what it means i don't know but once you've learned it again you can sort of serial process or parallel process it again but generally for the whole book right one word one word one word at a time how nice would it be to open a book and just get it in your head oh next page boom right? you can just kind of take pictures of this speaking of pictures that is how we analyze pictures though right you open a book and you see a picture you do not need to scan it from top to bottom to understand the picture at that you just see it all at once and you get it you kind of parallel process all at once the information that you're seeing there visually but it's more discrete information is a different process it's the difference between me making a powerpoint where i flash words on the screen the dog ate a big fish and me showing you pixel by pixel in the middle of the screen when one comes the other disappears just in the center a picture of a dog eating a fish and then i say you know from those pixels that you saw one after another what was that you'd probably have a hard time constructing that back in your head such that you could read it and yet if i did it with words because of how we consume words no problem you'd be able to put that sentence back together and tell me uh, what it meant you could even paint a picture of the dog eating the fish question so uh gosh i, I have covered all this but I apologize, I want to catch you up. So, this is the difference, if any of you are computer folks, uh, between how a GPU, that is to say a graphical processing unit in your computer, the thing that makes you know, your graphics card, so to speak, and a CPU, uh, which is your central processing unit, uh, which is processing things like this, Whereas the graphical processing unit is, it's harder to, to explain, but it's basically putting down several things at once. If it were painting this wall or this, the back of here, what you can see, right, it would find all of the angles that were the same. It would find all of the colors that were the same. It would find all of the shapes that were the same. And it would put those down together. All right angles, all 40 degree angles, everything that's white, everything that's green, right? It's gonna show up like that rather than maybe like you've seen how a printer would print a picture right from top to bottom with not any sense of what things are the same because it can find similarities it's able to process that a lot quicker um And he's going to paint a picture for you guys in the way that a CPU might do it, as a series of discrete actions performed sequentially, one after the other. In three, two, one. Um, let me speed it up. Ladies and gentlemen, Leonardo. When we hit this trigger on this thing, 2,100 gallons of air goes through these accumulators, out these valves, into all 1,100 of these tubes, into these tubes, which in which the bottom of is a paintball. Each of those paintballs will fly across seven feet of space and in 80 milliseconds reach its target. Hopefully, when it's all said and done, it's going to paint the Mona Lisa. GPU <laughs> painting demonstration. Yep. And 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen.
closer to how a GPU would produce this, how a parallel process would occur. He tells you that there's actually paintball in each one of those tubes. Um, a, a closer way to a sort of parallel process would be if you had all of those tubes, right? And then certain tubes were connected to green dye, and then you had other tubes, and those tubes were connected to blue dye, right? And then when it held it to fire, each would go where it needed to be. Right? That's that's the parallel process. It is not that you kind of discreetly already decided what goes where, but that when you need it, it all sort of happened at the same time. It all forms itself together, rather than again looking at that serial process where it has to do each one at a time. Does this make sense? Any questions about this? You're right. This is covered like eight times in the other video, so if you didn't get it, it's close though. So one of the things that ends up happening because of the way that our brain is structured, um, is that some things are not on every side. the same side. Again, both can do both of these processes, but uh, again, one's going to be better at the other. So anything that is really specialized in terms of being a more serial uh, or parallel process, I shouldn't say anything, but some things that are more specialized in terms of needing to be a serial or parallel process will be what we call lateralized. What we're discussing is called brain lateralization, which is to say thinking about how one side of the brain is different than the other. So one of the ways that the brain is lateralized is that your language centers are exclusively on the right side of your brain, excuse me, left side of your brain. Your language centers are on the left side of your brain. Why is this? I've already told you, just tell it back to me so that I know that you heard it. Why are your language centers on the left side of your brain? Because you can check your calculator. Yes, very good. That's all I need is because it's a serial process, right? Not only reading, but speaking one word at a time is how I have to talk to you and also how I have to listen to you. One word at a time. And so because I'm basically, as you say, counting uh, the words, that is to say processing them serially, well, the brain has decided, <laughs> or whoever made it, right? The brain has decided that we're going to localize our speech centers uh, to this part of the brain. It's actually kind of two, and we'll talk about this. And one is more specifically for speaking and understanding, and the other is more for production of speech. But let's think really quickly before we get deep into that about what do you think is happening right here? That is to say, in the same area of the brain that on the left side, these, this brain is facing the front way, by the way, uh, but that on the same side of the brain, in the same space in the brain, that on the left side is producing speech, language, reading. What do you think 
that same area on the right side of your brain is doing Vision. with regard to parallel process. Yeah. Vision. Say again. Vision, like seeing. Uh, nope. Vision is actually way in the back, back there. Straight back is where your vision goes. <laughs> Here he goes to the side. I don't know if that's coincidence. What part of language might be a parallel process? There's a clue. This does have to do with language, communication and language. What part of that is a parallel process? Body language. It's a piece of it. Close. It's not exactly body language, though. But you're on the right track. Let me ask you this way. <laughs> what part of speech do you think is affected by this brain? This part of the brain. Let me ask you this way. What part of speech do you think is affected by this area of the brain? Let me ask you this way. What part of speech do you think is affected by this part of the brain? Foundation. What's that? Foundation, like how you speak? That's right. We're talking about intonation. We're talking really about all of those musical qualities of speech, right? The more artistic, if you will, aspects of speech. And so while getting the words right and getting them in order and saying what you mean to say is happening on the left side of your brain, that is a serial process, boom, ba boom, ba boom. Figuring out how you're going to structure the cadence of the words, when your pitch is going to change, right? thinking about the whole part of the sentence in order to understand the rhythm of it or understand the movement of it is what this right side of your brain is doing. We call this prosody, which is using, understanding, interpreting those more musical parts of speech, intonation, pitch, cadence, rhythm, Right, all of those more musical pieces. Um, even things like uh, our ability to detect emphasis and sarcasm. Right? You, you can't really get sarcasm if you can't hear how the person is saying it. Sometimes the context will help you, but generally you need to hear, yeah, right. right. That's going to help you know, okay, the person is being sarcastic. Questions about this? Yes, ma'am. Would someone who has a hearing disability I think it would depend on where the hearing disability is so um, if it's in the brain and certainly if it's you know on both sides of the brain that is actually unusual uh, then that would probably affect their their ability to have prosody um, if it's something in the ear specifically uh, if it's the cochlea if it's some other mechanism by which they just can't hear sound it's not a processing issue um, then yeah they should be able to do processing that might look different right if maybe it's in sign language you might I don't know anything about sign language but maybe there's some aspect of fluidity of fluidity of movement some aspect of cadence even uh, within their way of speaking uh, so yes they should still be able to access this though I don't know enough about it to tell you what that looks like great thought paper yes sir if you have a hearing problem, you could probably still do prosody, you know, through body language. Like, you know, if someone's being sarcastic, they may roll their eyes. If someone's angry, you know, the uh, facial changes and stuff like that. Sure. Um, the difference, though, is that you really have to think about that the brain is specialized in terms of what is processed where. What you're describing is visual information, all right? And it's also spatial information to some degree. And so those are just going to be taken to different places to be understood. This is really about sound and language. Again, with somebody who's got a hearing disability, or specifically if they're deaf, the brain has probably made some weird reroutings in order to understand language on a more visual level because they're not using this to hear, right? The brain's gonna say, hey, there's extra space, but this is really good at decoding language. Let's see if we can, I don't know how that works. Great talk. Uh, other questions about this stuff? Um,
<clears throat> so on the left side of your brain, on the left side of your brain, side of your brain. There are these two areas about here and here. I'll show them to you. We'll reel back in here in a second. Um, but both of these two areas are part of your speech or language centers. This dotted line I'm showing you is to represent the division between the frontal and Varietal lobes. My brain's really messed up. No, it does. Between the frontal and parietal lobes. So, this is just that full. And I'll show you a better one here in a second. This front area is what we call Baroka's area. And then this back area here. called Wernicke's area. This part of your brain, Broca's area, is involved with the production of speech, producing what it is that you want to say, it's also involved in the production and the understanding, the deciphering of grammar. Understanding how a verb interacts with an object, right? That it means that something was done to the object. You can imagine if you didn't know how these words work, how grammar works, if there's just a bunch of words in a sentence, you don't know who's doing what to whom, right? Your ability to use grammar to decipher Bill loves Mary is different than Mary loves Bill, or Bill and Mary are in love, right? Th those words together need some grammar to untangle their meaning. This is happening in Broca's area. In Wernicke's area, we are involved with the interpretation of speech, which again seems similar to what's going on with grammar, but this is specifically grammar. This isn't words, this isn't vocabulary, right? This isn't you don't understand anything about what the person is saying. This is I'm having a hard time getting your meaning, right? If stuff's happening down here, you're gonna have more of a difficult time really understanding words at all. Wernicke's area is also involved in the fluidity of speech. To, to make this distinction, and some people would argue even with what I'm telling you now, that is to say, when we discovered these areas 30, 40 years ago, 
we really did have this division of this is how you make speech, this is how you understand speech, right? But we start to get tangled up, right? Because here there is a piece of understanding going on in here, and there is a piece of being able to produce speech going on here, right? And so there is this kind of tangling of what's what. And so today we say, you know, it's really probably all of this area is doing a little bit of something, and it's not as cut and dry as one helps you understand and one helps you speak, speak, right? Because if you can't understand what, what other people are saying, and I'll show you this in a second, it's gonna be hard for you to understand even what you're saying. Question, other stuff? So again, when you flip that over, right, we're having some, I couldn't tell you specifically, like I can with speech, but we're having some of that piece of language, um, those musical aspects, when you flip the brain around on the other side. <clears throat> um, so we won't watch all of this. So um, this was a, a patient, and basically what this little piece of the documentary is telling you um, is that there was a patient, they codenamed him Ta, because that's all he could say. Uh, so there was this patient, and he came in with brain damage, and this is uh, what his brain looks like, right? And so you can see, this, all of this has basically been eaten away. Um, and so this was one of the first times, one of the first patients where they were realizing, right, a lot of his other functionality was still intact, but what really seemed to be deficient, what really seemed to be missing from this guy uh, was the fact that he could not understand, um, and probably in his case, he also could not interpret speech. Now this is the first, again, one of the first cases where they're looking at something like this, uh, and this is them identifying Broca's area in particular as the first place they recognized as being involved in speech. And then some years later, uh, we get this understanding of Wernicke's area. So um, they're basically taking it through, and I will show you this, this guy who, uh, when this was recorded, which looks like even before I was born, uh, has what we would call Broca's aphasia. Uh, and so Broca's aphasia is what happens when you have any type of damage to that area. Broca's aphasia uh, is what this guy has, is what uh, Toth had, they eventually called it uh, after that. And then similarly here, I'll show you in a second what Wernicke's aphasia looks like. So here's Broca's aphasia, thinking about what areas or what uh, processes Broca's area is involved in, uh, take a look at some of the ways in which this man communicates the way he speaks. Thank you. 
Why not for the So what did you see here about what kind of difficulties uh, this, this guy had in terms of communicating or understanding communication? So what's difficult for him? Yes, sir, in the book. That's right, so it seemed to be difficult for him to process all, all the words there in the sentence. They kind of give you the demonstration that, you know, maybe a hearing thing. It's not, they're just trying to make you understand, right, that his brain doesn't get those types of words. Yep, yes ma'am? It seems like he might have some difficulty with nouns and verbs. Okay. Now he can only understand the nouns and verbs. Right, so he can only really seem to be able to understand the nouns and verbs, right? This is happening, these are the actors, but he isn't able to put together who's acting on what, right? He isn't able to sort of grammatize, <laughs> grammatize, I don't know, uh, that sentence such that uh, he can understand. And he made it a passive sentence on purpose, right? So that you would actually have to know to flip it around rather than maybe just assume. And you might think that a guy like this eventually can just assume, hey, the object usually goes to the end of the sentence. I can work with that, but as soon as you flip it over, He's pretty mystical. Questions? Other questions? So again, here is uh, Broca's area. Um, again, it, uh, it, it's helpful for me. I get these confused all the time. I'm actually standing up here where it has gotten confused today. But uh, one way to remember, at least if you don't remember the names, what's going where, is that in the frontal lobe is always doing. The frontal lobe is always about production or output. And so here, because of this, this is the production of speech, that's going to be in the frontal lobe. And then the side of our brain, this parietal lobe, this temporal lobe, uh, are usually about understanding things. And so here uh, we have Wernicke's area where it's more about the interpretation, uh, the understanding of the speech. And so let's take a look at the difference between somebody who's got this Baroque's aphasia and somebody who's got the Wernicke's aphasia. Uh, one thing that I didn't hear you point out was not only did he have some difficulty with understanding the grammar, what else did you maybe notice about how he himself was speaking? Choppy. It was really choppy, right? Uh, you know, he had a lot of stutters, he had a lot of cuts, he had a lot of, I gotta think about how to say that, I gotta think about what that word means, right? And we all do that sometimes, I do it a lot. 
but he was doing it at every account, at every instant, or he had to really think about what it is exactly he wants to say, uh, because again, that part of his brain involved in the production of speech was damaged, and so he's gonna have a hard time just getting it out. But let's look at somebody who doesn't have damage to that area, who's, uh, who broke his area seemingly is intact, and yet this woman here is gonna have damage to uh, her Wernicke's area. I really hope you can hear this one. The subtitles might not have. Okay, so I heard you say it's not like she was stuttering, like she couldn't understand it. Yep. It sounds like she was having issues trying to like interpret what was happening, and then so she was trying to mock it, but she couldn't get the it down. That's right. This is what I see. Right? Is really what's going on. Uh, first and foremost, is she's having trouble here interpreting what the other person is saying. She knows the woman wants her to do something. Right, and so when she hears her say a thing, she is trying, sometimes she does it immediately. You did see that some of the things she got, some of the things she got after seemingly the experimenter or whoever this uh, doctor was, it, seemed, it sounded like demonstrated herself. Can you smile, can you smile, see you smile? I don't think you can see me here, but uh, right, that she seemingly was showing her and then the woman would just repeat that. Uh, and then other times it seemed like she couldn't get her to do it at all. Right? She just totally didn't understand, she didn't even understand. Uh, trying to mock her doing uh, the thing that she was showing. And so mostly, right, we're hearing, we're seeing this piece where she is not getting kind of the game even. She's not uh, interpreting what the woman is saying. Uh, what else is going on there though? What about the way she was repeating the words? Did she do it well? It sounded like she was still like making each uh, letter of the word. Yeah. And then she was trying to put it together to figure out what it was. You are overthinking it. <laughs> hold, hold that thought. You are overthinking it a little bit. What's going on with her? It's just nonsense. She, she's not able to construct what she wants to say. This is what I meant about the fact that being able to speak also means that you need to be able to interpret your own speech. The weird thing about the Wernicke's aphasia versus the Broca's aphasia, which his 
speech was really slow, but he was getting out what he wanted to say, right? Her speech was fluid, but da 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 right? Like she was able to speak in a way that would be quick and orderly if she could get the words in there, but she wasn't able to get the words in there. She was able to be fluid and get, it, it sounded like she knew what she was saying, but we didn't know what she was saying. Right? That's how I interpret that, because she had no problems producing it. But her ability to interpret what she means to produce is the problem. Does this make sense? You might see with some of these people that they also have fluidity issues, which is really what this guy had in terms of uh, fluidity uh, as well. You might call that a production issue too. Uh, but for her, she didn't really have, I didn't see any fluidity issues. She was not stuttering, she was not, I mean, she was repeating, but that's not stuttering. She was not um, kind of choppy with her words. She was able to quickly say something back because she thought she knew what she was hearing and she thought she knew what she was saying, right? Here, uh, this guy almost had a better recognition that he didn't know some things, right? This woman did not seem confused at all. One of the profound things about that video of me is how she's happy. You know, when she's, my eye would be devastated. And you can't speak, you can't understand. This woman just having to ask him over and over again. She seemed to be pretty happy with her situation. So, I need that too. Uh, what am I doing now? What um, questions do you have about these two areas? So, lastly, Uh, what do you think this is? What's going on with this? Okay. Um, what do you mean? I like your, I see you working through it and you're really close. Who, who can help her out some? Yeah. Well, I mean, she's talking about the sensory, like what's being enlarged there are what your body uses to indicate the senses, so like touch, feel, smell, uh, hearing. And then in the motor, I would assume, since it's like the hand and the mouth, it's you know, how you communicate in terms of those motor skills, but otherwise I would assume that Okay, both pretty good, pretty good guesses. Let me help you. Um, you're basically right with the sensory information, though you should understand that what we're looking at here is the amount of brain space, brain capacity, brain processing, that your brain is devoting to each of these parts of your body, right? And, and able to, really, we're just talking about tactile sensation. We're not talking about the other senses. This is really just to do with touch. So as you noted, right, our hands are really sensitive. This is one of the buffs of being a human. So we have really sensitive hands, right? We can detect a lot of things uh, just by touching them with our hands. Our face, our mouth is really sensitive, right? We talked a little bit about maybe sticking things in our mouth. One reason they're doing that is because your mouth is sensitive and uh, you can get a lot of information uh, just tactically, but also you're gonna taste it and you're gonna smell it but here we're just looking at that tactile piece. So your lips, your face, it's gonna be really sensitive. Even your eyeballs, of course, pretty sensitive. Your feet, relatively sensitive compared to say your legs or your trunk. And then of course your genitals, pretty sensitive. And so you have a lot of brain space devoted to that too. <clears throat> On the other side here, what we see in terms of the motor, these are called homunculuses, homunculi. What we see on the motor homunculus, is uh, 
not, I don't know what you said, but uh, this is uh, how much brain space your, your brain devotes to being able to move those parts of your body, right? The, the um, subtlety uh, and in some cases the strength or the nuance in which you're able to move these parts of your body is illustrated here, right? Our hands are very dexterous, right? We can do a lot of things with our hand. We can paint a picture. We can pick up a fly wing. We can punch through a wall, right? All of these things are pretty diverse and require a lot uh, of dexterity, a lot of attention to detail in our movement. And then of course, um, you see here that your face is also gonna share some of that mostly What's trying to be pointed out here isn't your whole face, but really your lips, your tongue, and you can't see it, but is larynx because this is how we speak, right? We need to have a lot of dexterity in terms of the sounds we can make and the shapes we can make with our mouth in order to communicate really effectively with another human body. <clears throat> so if you look at the brain, so this is sort of a top-down image. You're looking uh, down at somebody's brain. Uh, up is the top or the front of this person. And so you can see that here, by the way, this line between the blue and the, and the red, this is the division, the central fissure, is what we call it. Um, that's not right. This is the central fissure, the frontal fissure. Is what we call it. So in front of that line, on top of that line, is the frontal lobe, and below that line, but starting with the blue down, uh, is your parietal lobe. And so there's that division between the two things. This is helpful because, again, the frontal lobe is always about doing. The frontal lobe is always about output. It's not about that input interpretation piece. It's always about doing something outside of yourself. And so this red line, is in the frontal lobe, and it's your motor cortex. Uh, if you remember me talking about the cerebellum, uh, it would have been in the video for you, we talk about how the cerebellum is, is using the information from this part of the brain to actually orchestrate movements, right? I want to pick up this pin, well that's the idea that I have, but the actual coordination of movement, the actual what muscles are going to fire when in sequence such that my hand isn't going all over the place, right? I just want to pick up this pin. That's happening uh, in the cerebellum. That is to say, it's that kind of wrinkly piece at the base, the bottom of your, of your brain. If I drew a good brain, it'd be right there. But here is where you're making that conscious decision to move. Here's where you're saying what you want to do. Here's where you're thinking about how you're gonna move your body in this way. And this part of your brain can override to some degree your cerebellum, that is to say, if you want to bump into a thing or if you want your motion to be a little more shaky, these types of things. Um, and if you watch a video where we look at the person who has a cerebellar ataxia, which is their cerebellum is broken, you can basically see that they can still orchestrate their movements, but they have to be really purposeful about them. It's not this kind of fluid movement where I can just say, hey, walk over there, and my body figures it out on its own. I would have to really think about each step that I'm taking very, very consciously, because this part of your brain is really devoted to more conscious movements. Usually, that is just saying what you want to do, so to speak, and you let the cerebellum, the unconscious part of your brain, handle it. Uh, but you can probably think of times when you're learning uh, something new, you're learning a dance, you're learning a sport, you're learning a, how to drive, right? These types of things where you kind of have to take over because you don't have this automatic plan already seen uh, in this part of your brain. Frontal uh, lobe contains what we call, again, this motor cortex. You can see literally mapped on uh, this cortex. By the way, this red piece is on both sides. If you want to move both sides of your body, you're going to need a motor cortex on both sides of your brain. I've had students in the past get confused just because of the way this diagram is that it's only on this side or this side. Both the blue and the red are on both sides of your brain. They're just drawn out larger 
here. So you can just see on your brain, right, uh, for the motor cortex, where stuff is. So right down in the middle there is where your feet are, and then you're coming up to the top, and you got your knees and your elbows, and then right about here, it looks like, you got your hands, and this huge section devoted to your face, and then this huge section relatively devoted to your tongue, larynx, and pharynx, right? And so this is literally, if you've ever seen some type of movie, or maybe even kind of reality show where they poke in somebody's brain and they say, hey, oh, your arm's moving, or hey, can you feel this, right? This is where they're poking. Super convenient, again, it's really on the outside of the brain. I just need to take a little piece of your skull off. <laughs> I can make you do anything I want. Uh, so then in the blue section, of course, we've got the somatosensory cortex, sometimes just called the sensory cortex. Um, and similarly here, some of the things are almost similarly placed, though uh, there are some things moved, there are some things added. But again, this is really just the same thing uh, in terms of how you're sensing things. So a lot of space on the face, a lot of space on the tongue, a lot of space on the hands, a lot of space on the genitals. So these are gonna be the parts of our body that are most tactically uh, sensitive. Similar to what I was saying, about the motor cortex and being able to take your skull off and just poke in your brain. Uh, this would be me being able to poke in your brain and have you go, do you feel that uh, in your gums? <laughs> you can say yes, it feels like you're poking me in the gums. Questions here? Um, So I'll just finish out by uh, giving you a, a sort of a broad overview, this won't take long, um, of just what is happening in different areas of the brain. You've heard me referencing it uh, today, but just to give you something to know for sure. Uh, first of all, just understanding the brain. We have a different name for basically the hills and the valleys of the brain. We call the hills or those mounds, we call them gyri or gyrus. Gyrus, plural, gyri. We call the folds, we call those little valleys, we call them sulcus or sulci. And then we call those really deep folds, the ones that basically separate hemisphere from the other or different lobes from one another. We call those fissures. So these are deeper sulci are called fissures. So in the frontal lobe there, again, really this is going to be involved in planning, anything that we're doing, so to speak. So uh, we're going to have planned movement. We're going to have executive functions, literally our ability to plan, right? What am I doing after he finally lets us out of class? Right, that ability is something that's happening in your frontal lobe, being able to make judgments, being able to make decision making. This is the part of the brain you've probably heard folks say, oh, you, this part of your brain isn't developed until you're 25, 27. Uh, this is the part of your brain where you make decisions, where you decide, is that a good thing to do? Is, or should I do this thing that feels more impulsive or this thing that feels more emotional, right? This is the part of the brain that can put a stop to those things. Uh, and this is why teenagers, adolescents, even college students tend to be more impulsive is because this part of their planning, organizing, what's going to happen in the future, that part of their brain is not as well developed until they're in their mid-20s. Um, again, also in there is going to be Broca's area, production of speech, um, and then the production of prosody. In the parietal lobe, which is here just right on top, uh, this is mostly involved in processing spatial uh, information and somatosensory information, that is to say, um, excuse me, spatial and sensory information. So the spatial is kind of where things are, where our body is. It's going to be a piece of that sensory piece, but also literally is my arm stuck out, is it stuck up, am I about, about to walk off the stage? <clears throat> Those pieces are going to be in the parietal lobe. Um, also being able to, uh, that spatial awareness, kind of understand direction, spin around things in your head, understand how it would look from this perspective, all of that 
is happening in the parietal lobe, these sort of movement understanding, these sort of facial understanding uh, right up top. In the back, in the occipital lobe, which is the smallest, but it's almost entirely devoted to processing vision. So vision of all of our senses has its own lobe. It's a relatively small lobe, but uh, that is how important vision is for us, is that the brain says, here, you can have this whole wing of the house. And then lastly, you've got the temporal lobe, uh, which is gonna be, of course, at your temples. And this is mostly involved in processing uh, sound. It's also involved in processing memory and smell. Um, the globally, some stuff that's uh, happening in here, uh, again, is memory, mostly in the temporal lobe. That's one thing uh, that we didn't get to get to. Maybe I'll include some of that in our sensory, uh, in our sensory lecture, but uh, otherwise, that is it for the brain. We've kind of got through all three sections. Um, if you haven't, go ahead and start watching uh, the videos that are posted, more to come uh, on some of the other brain science. Um, I will email you about when the test will be. Um, this is usually one of the tests that folks think is uh, kind of one of the more difficult tests. Uh, so if you haven't been following along in the lectures, do make sure that you do, because uh, I mean, there's brain science in it. And, there's not a whole lot of different ways to ask about that except to just know it. All right, have a good weekend. I'll see you next week.